Hey, good morning. Pastor Chad with Mohican Church. Glad you could join us this morning. As we plan to get into the scriptures, uh, we wish you could be here with us, but we're really glad that you have the opportunity to tune in uh, via video. And so we have been going through a series on Sunday mornings. It's called We Believe. And so we are essentially working through our statement of faith, taking every one of the statements as it is written, and, and looking to see what it is we believe and why it is that we believe those things according to the scriptures. And so, so today we're going to be uh, in letter K. And by the way, you can find our entire statement of faith on our website, mohicachurch.org. And you should be able to find the statement of faith right there under the resources, uh, the resources tab. And so I would encourage you to look that up, check that out. Uh, again, we are going to be looking through letter K today. Um, <clears throat> before we do that, let's, uh, let's go to prayer. So join me if you would. Father God, this morning, I thank you so much for the ability that we have to, to live and to breathe, first of all. Lord, we praise you that you have put your breath in our lungs again. And so as we have every opportunity, let us to praise your name. Wherever it is we find ourselves this morning, whether it's gathered together with a group of believers, which is ideal, or whether we don't have an opportunity to do that this morning for whatever reason, Lord, we, we look to you, and, and it is our desire to, to worship you. It's our desire to look into your word for the purpose of knowing you more. So, Lord, we look to you with expectation, oh God, that you would do that in us that you would help us to fix our eyes on you. Lord, that they would be directed off of all of the other things that don't matter nearly as much right now. And help us to, to consider you, to consider your word. I'm grateful for your nearness to us, Lord, as we gather together, but also as we are separated. And in and, and those various times throughout the week, I'm grateful to know that there's no place that we can go out of your view. There's no place we can go out of your reach. And so we rejoice in that. Thank you that you know us all together. That, that everything we have going on, Lord, you already know and you are sufficient for. And so help us to trust you. We thank you, Lord. Uh, we ask your special blessing on us. I pray that that you would help us to hear your word, Lord, that despite these faulty lips, and that you would speak directly to our hearts, knowing that you have spoken in your word, help us to hear and help us to absorb. We thank you, Lord, and we look to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So like I mentioned, we are in uh, looking at the statement of the letter K this morning. And I found it pretty, uh, pretty funny, actually. Pastor Paul is on vacation, so that's why you're seeing me this morning. Pastor Paul's on vacation, and, and as we were discussing the preaching schedule, this is some time back now, the, the preaching schedule coming up and, and, and which ones I was going to be covering, he said, uh, he said yeah, you'll be, you'll be taking letter K, and, and I looked at it, and I, I laughed, and I said, is... Uh, <laughs> At first reading, I said, I said, was that like a miscellaneous category? <laughs> that, that we threw a few things in there, what we believe, all very solid. Um, but I thought that, that could be an interesting one to preach. I said, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for taking vacation right now. <laughs> all in good fun. But seriously, as we look at this one, the title for, for today's sermon is, We Believe the Lordship of Christ. And so I'm going to read this. Uh, again, I, I trust that you, you look, those, look up the statement of faith and you need to read along. I want to read this statement of faith and talk a little bit about it and then dive into uh, to some of the scriptures. And here's what it says. We believe that we must dedicate ourselves to prayer, to the service of our Lord, to his authority over our lives, and to the ministry of evangelism. We believe that the ministry of evangelism and discipleship is the responsibility of all followers of Jesus Christ. 
And of course, we have a bunch of scripture references down there at the bottom that relate to uh, the truths in the state in the statement. As I read that, perhaps you uh, you also were with me, uh, thinking that if you were going to preach a sermon, a single sermon on this right here, it might be a tall order, because it seems at first that there are a number of uh, different things. We have prayer. We have service of our Lord. We have his authority in our lives. We have evangelism and discipleship. But I, but I want us to, to look at the fact that, that central to all of this is, is the Lordship of Christ, which is why the title of the sermon is The Lordship of Christ. And so that's what we are going to, to focus on, his Lordship first. And then look at some of these other things that that essentially flow from a life that is submitted to the Lordship of Christ. Some of these things that are responsibilities and responses of the one who is under the authority of, submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so, as we uh, think about that word Lordship, or the word Lord, we see it very various times in the Scriptures. The scripture, the, the single scripture, out of the list of them that I, uh, that we have for that statement, uh, the, the one scripture that I chose to, to kind of read at, at the very beginning and then also reference various times within the sermon is Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, and specifically verses 9 through 13. And this is what, uh, this is how it reads in the ESV. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And I'll stop right there. That's actually through verse 15. Praise God for his word. Perhaps that's a scripture that you have heard many times. As we think about the question, what must I do to be saved? And as we look through the scriptures, this is one that we come to often. And it says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Question is, what it does this mean to call Jesus Lord? What does this mean? Is it, just a, uh, is it just a phrase that we use, a Christian phrase that is acceptable to God, that, that, that helps us to obtain salvation? What is this? This lordship of Christ is central to this statement of faith and the things that flow from a life submitted to his lordship. Here is what Lord means. This is how it is, it, how, uh, the, the, what the word means and how it is used in various places in the scriptures. And here it is. It means this, supreme in authority, controller, master, he to whom a person or thing belongs. Just kind of marinated in that for a minute. That's essential, I believe, to us understanding the Lordship of Christ. Now we know from the scriptures, of course, that, that he, is, he is Lord of all creation. It doesn't take us long as we, uh, as we get into the scriptures. We can see that uh, in Colossians 1 and in Hebrews 1, by the way, these scripture texts, we're not turning to all of them, but you can find them in the notes on the website attached to this, to this video. But we see from scriptures in Colossians 1 and Hebrews 1 that, that he made everything. As a matter of fact, Christ was there at creation and nothing was made except that he made it. 
And so, so all of creation was made by him. Hebrews 1, uh, Hebrews chapter 1 also speaks of the very same thing. And everything, not only was it made through him and by him, it was made for him, for his glory. Now, the skies proclaim his majesty, right? All of creation, he is the Lord of it, he is the owner of it, the master of it. The one to whom it belongs. It's all for his glory. We also see in Revelation 17 and in Revelation 19 a description of him as he is returning because Christ is returning a victor. He is returning and it mentions that he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. There is none like him. There is none beside him. All things are under his authority, under his ownership, his control. He is master of all. Knowing that, the question that follows as we are looking at the lordship of Christ is this. Is he, in fact, lord of us? Is he lord of me? And in asking that question, considering this, we are, we are not questioning God's sovereignty. We're not, we're not questioning the fact that, that he owns it all, that he has created it all, and we are included in that. What we are asking is that are we submitted to his lordship? Are we submitted to his lordship? Again, all of this statement is central, uh, is, is the central figure of this statement is the lordship of Christ in our lives. Question is, is he? Are we submitted to him as Lord? Look, in, in life, as we go through life and, and out there in culture, every, there are so many lords. Don't hear me wrong. There is one God, though there are many things that can be worshipped. In fact, there are many things that are worshipped. There are many things that we could look at this definition of Lord, and there are many things that fit that for our lives. The one supreme authority, the controller of, the master of, the thing to whom a person or thing belongs. So many lords. I can let you sit and think about what those could be in your life. Perhaps it's a, it's a job. It's a career. Perhaps it's, it's your cell phone. Perhaps it's your schooling. Perhaps it's a friend group. Perhaps it's sports. You name it, there's a variety of them. We have so many things in our lives that can be described as Lord. The thing is that because of the fall, because we are all in sin, we by default reject the Lordship of Christ. We by default reject His Lordship and we replace it with with lordship of other things. The lordship of self. In all reality, what we are doing um, is submitting to the lordship of, of sin, of Satan, rather than the lordship of Christ. And so that's, that's where we are by default. Now we know that the scriptures say that everyone, that there's without, it, without exception, everyone will acknowledge the Lordship of Christ, will submit to the Lordship of Christ. Philippians chapter 2 says this, it says that, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. The only thing is that, that some of those, most of those, are going to bow the knee and acknowledge His Lordship after it's too late. The beautiful thing is that the option for us to submit to his lordship now equals salvation. Romans chapter 3, the text that we read says this, but if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, 
Just stop right there. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, is that just saying something? Here, utter these words. No, what that's talking about is pointing to the heart. It's pointing to, to, to what is inside, the essence of a person. And acknowledging that Jesus is Lord is, is just like saying, I believe that he is Lord. I am, I am saying that he is Lord. Remember that the scriptures talk much about the fact that what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. So it's not, he's not talking about just a phrase that you utter, but a reality that we submit to, that Jesus is Lord. And so the option to submit to his lordship now, it, it, it equals salvation. Something that we have in the, um, I think maybe in the Western culture, that we have, that we have uh, somewhat believed wrongly is we have separated salvation from Lord, meaning this. We think about Jesus as Savior and Lord, the one who saves us and our master that we obey, that we submit ourselves to. And, and sometimes I believe that there is a, a distinction there, almost like, have you ever been part of a club? Maybe it's AAA, that's one that came to my mind. Because, uh, because I'm a member of AAA. Now, you can get AAA, which uh, is just a, the very plain base package, and they'll come to save you. But you can also upgrade to, uh, to a plus package, which, by the way, I do. But you think about, a, you think about a, an organization like that, a club, a membership, and you name it, of, of whatever. And, and sometimes we... We've got these entry level, like, I'm going to get just enough of this. I'm going to have just enough. If it's AAA, hey, I don't need all of those toes. I don't need all of the, the mileage. All I need is this. Now, I can invest more, and, and I can have this. But, but, but I don't need that right now. Just entry level is all I need. Sometimes we mistakenly take that mentality, and we apply it to Jesus. And sometimes we think that, that there's an option to, to have him as our Savior. I don't want to go so far as my Lord and my Master, the one to whom I submit and obey. I just want the salvation part. And so if I say these things, you know, if I, if I, make, this, uh, if I make this confession, that I believe who he is, and then I'm going to be okay. I don't want to go so far as to submit to him as Lord. That's not, that's not accurate. Savior and Lord is one thing. Turning to Christ in faith for salvation equals submitting to him as Lord. And so there's not two different membership levels. Romans 3, I'm sorry, Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. That is a picture of, of turning to Him. That's a picture of, of repentance because you know that when we turn to Him, we're turning from something. It's at that time when we turn to Him, there's a change of authority in our life. There's a, there's a change of masters because we serve a master. We have a Lord. Everybody listening to me, whether or not you, uh, you, you trust in Jesus, you serve a master. You have a Lord. When we, turn to, when we turn to Christ in submission to Him, that is equal to salvation and lordship of Christ. Those are, those are intertwined. You cannot divorce them. And so when we turn to him, we have this change of authority, we have a change of masters, we are no longer slaves of sin, but we are slaves of God. That comes right out of Romans 6, um, throughout Romans 6, but verse 22 specifically. Therefore, genuine faith in Christ always produces authentic obedience. 
Because a turning to Christ for the salvation he offers is the same as turning to him and submitting to him as Lord. You are mine. I turn from this and I turn to you and I submit to you. I think this is that, that kind of false thinking that Jesus is, is, he can be your savior, but for this much more, he can also be your Lord. I think that has led to a very dangerous teaching, I think has led to a lot of false conversions. People, uh, people that are not in Christ, that believe that they are. And so I will, I will give this brief warning regarding that. Beware of identifying in word only with Jesus. Beware of identifying in word only. You know, like, oh no, hey, I said a prayer one time, and so I, you know, I, I said that I believe that he is who he is one time, and I, I, I invited him into my heart one time. Be very careful that you're not identifying with him in word only. There's warnings in the scripture about folks like that. Luke chapter 6, 46 through 49, also Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23. It gives us pictures of this. And this is where we have people that, that at the end they say, wait, Lord, you know, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do this in your name? They cry out to him, Lord, Lord, wait a minute, didn't we? And he, he looks at them and he says, depart from me, I never knew you. You see, these are individuals that identified with him, perhaps had close proximity to him, close proximity to the, the truth. Perhaps they knew exactly who he was. Maybe they, they, they believed that he was God, that he, he, he did die and, and raise again the third day and ascended to be the right hand of God. Perhaps they believe all that. But remember, even the demons believe that and they tremble. These individuals surely identified with him, but they were never submitted to him. Again, genuine faith always produces authentic obedience because our lordship has changed. And so we no longer serve sin, the master of sin, but now we are, we are serving God. And here's another great truth. This is a beautiful truth that... that as we have our, our, our submitted to the Lordship of Jesus, that desire to serve Him is also met with the power to serve Him, the ability to serve Him. Because as we turn from Him, submitting to His Lordship, we are also given the indwelling Holy Spirit, which we've talked about a lot um, in, in the recent past. We've been given the indwelling Holy Spirit, and that coupled with, frankly, even we're even given the desire to serve Him, but but the, the desire to serve him coupled with the ability to serve him is a beautiful thing. And that's how we are able to live life for his glory as we continue to be submitted to his lordship and we have the indwelling Holy Spirit enabling us and empowering us to serve. So, the lordship of Christ. In that statement that we that we read, again, the Lordship is, is in there and it is, and it is central to the rest of the statement because the rest of the statement, these are things that flow from a life that is under submission to the Lordship of Christ. Uh, specifically, um, there's, there's service of Him, and we could spend a long time talking about service because you could look at various areas where, where we could serve Him, and so we're not going to go into much of that this morning. So we have service to him, we have prayer, we have evangelism, and we have discipleship. All of these things are in that statement, and they do flow from a, a life that is under the submission to the lordship of Jesus. We'll briefly look at each one of those three, prayer, evangelism, and discipleship, just now. And again, I realize that we could... We could get into every one of these things. It could be a, a long series. And so I'll try not to do that this morning. One of the things that flows from a life submitted to the Lordship of Christ is prayer. It's a responsibility of someone under the Lordship of Christ, but it's also a natural response 
of someone who is under the Lordship of Jesus. There are so many scriptures that we could look at that, that encourage us, command us, essentially, to pray, to be in prayer. A lot of the things that Jesus said to his disciples while he was walking this earth inferred that they would be praying, and indeed he commanded them to pray. I want to highlight just a couple of those right now. Matthew 6 is one of them where, where he was teaching, and he said, pray then like this. First he said, when you pray, which is inferring that they will be praying, and then he even gave a template for prayer, which we know of as the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that the Lord taught the disciples. And we see there that, that He is instructing them to pray and even teaching them how to pray. It's a central part of life. It's, it's, it's an essential part of, of a life of one who is in Christ. Prayer. Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38. We see that Jesus was having compassion on the multitudes, that they were like, they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he was moved, his heart of compassion was moved for them. And he looked at the disciples and he said, hey, the harvest, is, the harvest is, is ready. He said, you pray for workers of the harvest. Pray for workers to go out and, and, and do the harvesting. I see a couple of things in here. Number one, Jesus telling the disciples they need to pray. Listen, if there wasn't a need for prayer, Jesus wouldn't have made it such a point to pray and to instruct to pray. This is essential. He looked at them. He, as he was looking at the masses, those who were weary and lost, like they didn't have a shepherd, and he was moved with compassion for them, and he turned to the disciples and said, the, the harvest is great, it's ready. Pray for workers of the harvest. And so he's telling them to pray, it's essential, but, but also in this, I want us to consider this, that prayer is not just something that, that strengthens our relationship with God. It does. As a matter of fact, I hear people many different times say, why should we pray? God is, he's all-knowing. He's sovereign. Why do I need to pray? He, I'm not making him aware of anything, and and I'm not going to twist his arm to make him do something he doesn't want to do. So why do we need to pray? That's a great question. And I just told somebody the other day, well, because he said so. And I kind of say that with a chuckle right now. But the fact of the matter is, we, we can't fully comprehend all of what happens when we pray. I'm convinced we can't fully comprehend all that happens, and, and, and I can't fully comprehend why it is that he would use my prayer when he already knows what's going on, and he is, he is a sovereign God. He is in full control of, of things. But here's what we know. According to the Scriptures, we are called to pray. It will strengthen our relationship, our fellowship with God with the Father. But I believe this too, according to the Scriptures, that, that He is ordained to do some of the work that He does by the prayers of His people. I've heard it said like this, you are never going to twist God's arm to make Him do something that, that is against His will. However, I wonder what He is waiting to accomplish until His people petition him for it. We have been called to be a people of prayer. It, it, it's beautiful communion with our Lord, but he also uses it practically to do his work, to do his will. And so it's a responsibility of ours, absolutely, that we're called to. We've been commissioned to do it. But it should be something also that is a natural response. That, that once we are submitted to the Lordship of Christ, it ought to be partly a natural response. To desire to communicate with Him. To desire to, to essentially declare our dependence upon Him. 
There are various places in the scriptures where we see it, we see examples of, of someone praying. One that if you've been around here for very long at all, you've heard me mention King Jehoshaphat back in 2 Chronicles 20. I love the the reason I continue to, to point back to that is because in his prayer there, when they were under siege, when they were under attack, his prayer there as the king of Judah, in front of all of his people, was this. Lord, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. I don't know what to do, but, but I am in submission to you. I am submitted to your lordship. I know who you are. It's a beautiful picture of dependence, and, and, it's, and such it should be with us. Those who have, who, who have changed masters, and now we are Lord. We are, the, we are in submission to our Lord Jesus. Part of that natural response ought to be often declaration of dependence upon him, calling out to him. But of course, another example is Jesus in Luke 5.16. Luke 5, 16, where we get one of, the, uh, one of the instances where Jesus would depart often to a deserted place to pray. Now you think about this, this is Jesus. This is Jesus, um, and, and, and he goes off to, to pray to the Father. What a beautiful example for us, but what a, what a beautiful picture of of the absolute importance of prayer in our lives. And interestingly enough, isn't that one of the places where the enemy loves to distract us? It continues to be the case that prayer meetings are one of the least attended things in church life. And have you ever noticed that in your own prayer time, how easy is it to get distracted? How easy is it to, to, to let your mind get so distracted on other things that Pretty soon you find yourself either asleep or writing down a grocery list or whatever else. It makes sense that that would be one of the things that, that the enemy would love to keep us from. Prayer. So to be dedicated to prayer is one of the things that should flow from a life that is under submission to the Lordship of Christ. The second thing is evangelism. Evangelism is sharing the good news of Jesus, essentially. This, uh, this taking out, this holding out of the gospel message to those around us, to those who, like us, desperately need a Savior. Now again, I believe that this is a responsibility that we have because our statement of faith said that evangelism is, um, is something that every believer is called to as his discipleship. So I believe it's a it's a responsibility that we have, but I also believe that, it, that it's a natural response. It's a natural response. Now, granted, all of these things as natural responses, they need cultivated. They need cultivated, and, and, and as we do them, we will frankly do them more. We have a variety of scriptures that talk about evangelism and our need to do it. One of them, Matthew 28, where Jesus says, Go, therefore make disciples of all nations. And we can stop right there and we can say, Wait a minute, that's talking about disciples, not evangelism. Well, the first start, of, the first part I would suggest of discipleship is evangelism. They, they have to know. They have to know before, before they can grow in Christ, they have to know who he is and what he has done. And so evangelism is absolutely essential in the making of disciples. But one of the problems is that they go and make disciples. Some see that as, hey, just go make converts, walk away and go make others. No, we'll talk about what that discipleship could look like and should look like. But evangelism is the taking of the good news. The, hey, here is, what, here, is, here is who Jesus is. Here is what he has done in me. Let me tell you about the good news of the cross of Christ. And essentially starting out with the bad news. Because without the bad news, the good news means nothing. So go, make disciples. First Peter 3. We're told that we need to be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. You know, for all of these individuals that we work with. We ought to look different. Those of us who are under submission to the Lordship of Christ, we ought to look different. And 
And that looking different ought to, that looking different, sounding different, acting different, should lead to others saying, what is wrong with you? What's your problem? And it might be in words like that. And 1 Peter 3 says, you be ready to give an answer. When they ask about this hope that resides within you. Be ready to tell them. Don't, don't be ready to tell them, hey, look, you know what? I, I, I grew up in a nice home. I grew up in a... Hey, look, I, you know, I, I had this other great thing. No. Be quick to say, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about his impact in my, in my life. Let me tell you about what he did to take me from death to life. And, and now he has, he has put a, a, a heart of flesh in me. He's put a new song in my mouth. A praise to our God. This, this being ready to take the gospel, this holding out of the gospel to those around us. Some say this, uh, this task of evangelism, it, it belongs only to those who possess the gift, the spiritual gift of evangelism. There are spiritual gifts. And each one of us that have come under the authority of Christ have been given at least one. Evangelism is one of those. And so some say that, that evangelism is, it should only be left to those who have the spiritual gifting of evangelism. And I believe, we believe, that the scriptures say otherwise. Should those individuals be doing evangelism? Absolutely. But it is the responsibility of all of us as a sinner saved by grace to share that message. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, he called Timothy, who does not appear to have the gift of evangelism, he called to Timothy, he says, do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. And of course, various places in the scriptures, like the 1 Peter 3 passage, where it talks about be ready to give an answer for the reason of the hope that lies within you. We believe that this is a responsibility of every believer that we have been called to. 2 Corinthians 5, and forgive me for hitting some of these or just referencing some of these quickly, but some of these, they're very important and we can't go through all of them in the time that we have right now. But 2 Corinthians 5, I will turn to. Because 2 Corinthians 5 says this, verses 18 through 20. As a matter of fact, let me start with 17. It says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God, making his appeal through us, we implore you, implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Do you see that? That we are made a new creation in Christ, and we are given the ministry of reconciliation, Essentially ambassadors of him saying, be reconciled to God, and here's the way. And of course, referencing back to Romans 10, how are they going to believe on one whom they have not heard? And how are they going to hear without someone proclaiming it to them? So evangelism is a responsibility of one who is under the lordship of Jesus. And of course, it's also a natural response of someone who has come to Jesus and found newness of life. I've heard the statement before, certainly not original to me, but I've heard the phrase before, the statement before, that it's like we are beggars telling other beggars where we have found bread. You know that elation, you know that joy, like when you, when you found something that you so desperately needed and it so hits the spot, you're like, hey guys, Hey, hey, guys, you need to see this. 
someone who has come under the lordship of Christ and, and, and who genuinely knows what he has done for them, this is part of the natural response. We see it in, in one, of, uh, well, one of the individuals we see it from in the scriptures is the woman at the well in John 4. You know, when Jesus meets her there at the well and they have this, this uh, drawn-out dialogue and, and we know that Jesus is there on purpose and she doesn't know that she's there on purpose, but she is. She begins to understand who he is and, and what he is telling her and, 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 and she gets it and she runs back into the town. And by the way, she didn't want to be around people at all. That's why she came to the well when she did. She didn't want to be um, around those other women because they, they knew her. They knew her story. But when she came to know who Jesus was, and she experienced what she experienced in him, it was her natural response. She went back to the city, and she said, hey, hey, and I can, I can picture her grabbing people by the collar. Hey, let me tell you about a man. Let me tell you about this one that I just met. You've got to come and see. And they did. And they did. So we believe that, that a life who is, who is under submission to the Lordship of Christ, from that flows a life of prayer. From that flows a life marked by evangelism. And from that flows a life marked by discipleship. Now, when we say discipleship, what we essentially mean is, is growing and helping others to grow in Christ. Growing in our walk with Him. Now, we might hear some of this, hey, here's what flows from the life that is marked um, by the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And we hear prayer, evangelism, discipleship. We can pretty quickly, a lot of us, hold ourselves up to that and say, am I really in Him? Don't get me wrong. We continually are, are made more and more like Jesus as we are, we are continually sanctified. Our lives continue to, to we were growing and we're, we're, we're matching in life our position in Christ. And so, if you're saying, hey, I just came to faith in Christ and, and, and I'm not really seeing much of this in me. This has to do, as where discipleship comes into play. We are, we are to grow and help others to grow in Jesus, to grow closer to him. 2 Peter 3.18 says this, he calls us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's a command, to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have a responsibility in our own growth. Don't get me wrong, we don't do the growing. I mean, we don't make the growth happen, but, but what we do is we put ourselves in, in, the, in the places where growth will be likely to happen. Well, we, we help to, to cultivate, the, cultivate the circumstances, cultivate the, um, the, the, our, our lives, put ourselves in the places where we will be most likely to grow. Ephesians 4, as we think about, as we, we get ready to close out here, and we think about this discipleship, we, we have a responsibility to grow in Christ, to, to grow ourselves, but also we have a responsibility to help others to grow. We, are, we, we can't get away from body life. Um, so I guess I would challenge you, if you're watching this now and you've gotten into a habit of only watching sermons online and never having any contact with, with other brothers and sisters in Christ, I, I, I applaud you for sitting under the hearing of the word. But I will encourage you that, that not being part of a body life, not being in contact with other brothers and sisters, you are missing something. You are missing something. Because God has purposed us. He has put us in a body. And we have impact on one another. Listen to this. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, 
for building up the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Do you hear that? How, the, how being part of the body is how we grow. And as a matter of fact, every, every member is to be equipped for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. I would suggest that you also check out all of the one another's in Scripture. Um, we recently referenced that on a Sunday morning. But all of the one another's, and it's, and it's talking about body life, how we are to interact with one another. And the ways that we are to interact with one another have impact on each other and the way that we grow as we are walking and following Christ, the one who is Lord of our lives. And so, to wrap up, the Lordship of Jesus is the most essential thing in our lives. Are we submitted to the Lordship of Christ? And from that, from a life submitted to the Lordship of Christ, there's many things that should flow, but these are, these are some of them. Service to him, prayer, evangelism, and discipleship. I praise God for uh, his grace toward us, uh, for his loving compassion toward us, for his, his condescension to us, his, his saving us, and his putting us into the body and commissioning us to ministry. Join me as we pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your, uh, for your word. And I thank you for this opportunity to, to look into it, to see what it is that we believe and why do we believe that. I pray that this even, Lord, would just whet our appetites to dig in more. To dig into some of these things that we could have expanded on for, for months. I thank you for your word. I thank you for, oh, Lord, transferring us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Lord, as we, as we turn and submit to your Lordship, so grateful for the privilege of prayer and that you call us to the ministry of evangelism and discipleship. Help us to be engaged, Lord. Help us to be engaged. Help us to look to you and be glorified in us and through us, we pray. In the matchless name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining me. Love you all. Have a fantastic week. Get into the Word. Until next time, love you.